Uh, well, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Brogdon. I'm a barrister at Keating Chambers. Um, I'm joined with, uh, by, by Rachel at Henderson Chambers and Rosalind at Fountain Court Chambers. Um, we, we've been given a, a brief um, outline of things to discuss initially, um, which I'm, I'm intending will last about five or ten minutes from each of us, and then there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end. And we'd like to really make this um, about you and about the questions. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll hand over to these uh, these two ladies and let them introduce themselves. Um, yes, I am Rachel Tandy. I'm a barrister at Henderson Chambers. Um, I've been in practice for about five years now, and I specialise in commercial disputes, insurance, and product liability. I'm Rosalind Phelps QC. I'm at Fountain Court Chambers. I've been in practice since 1998, however long ago that is, and I took silk two years ago in 2016. I specialise in all kinds of commercial law, but especially banking, aviation and civil fraud. Thank you. Um, the, the questions, just to kick off the session, um, are why you chose the bar, and in particular why your area, uh, what type of cases barristers in your area deal with, um, what you find appealing about those areas, uh, what the lifestyle implications of those areas are, and uh, what key skills and personal qualities um, you think are needed. So turning to the first point, um, why, why you chose the bar. I mean, really, for, for me, um, the bar was about independence. Um, I, I didn't want to work for a law firm. I wanted to be able to, to broadly choose my own work and choose my own hours um, and, and dress how I wanted to dress when I come to work um, and uh, have, ha, ha, have my office the way I like it. Um, and, and I think it was independence that, that, that drew me. It, it allows you, I think, to take time off when you want to. Um, I, I like to go travelling sometimes um, or, or just, just take time out, out of my practice to do, to do what I like. And I think uh, the bar unlike other legal professions, allows you to do that with a lot more flexibility. Um, I, I do construction law um, and energy and technology law at Keating Chambers. Um, those are our core specialisms. Um, wh wh why those? Well, I mean, they, they tend to be technical disputes. Um, they are commercial law, so you get to do contract, uh, tort, and restitution um, with a, um, a, a, an angle towards um, construction disputes. I do a lot of cases. Um, generally, if it sinks, explodes, or is half built, you, you, you'd come to uh, you'd come to a set like mine. Um, I do cases involving shipbuilding. Uh, last week, I was in the world's largest shipyard in, in South Korea, which was incredibly interesting. Um, we, we do cases. I've got a, a, a nuclear power plant in Abu Dhabi uh, and a gas pipeline in Algeria, and we do disputes like that all over the world. Generally, the law will be English law. Uh, the seat of arbitration is, is usually London, but can often be uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Hong Kong, Trinidad, um, and, and really the dispute centres around the world. Um, and some of our members are, are cross-qualified in, in that area. Um, what do I find appealing about this area of practice? Well, it, again, it's, it's the, the technical nature that appeals to me. It, it allows you to get really stuck into a dispute, learn about something you've, you've never learned about, how to, how to build a bridge, how to build a nuclear reactor, what's important when welding a pipeline together. It's, it's the sort of stuff you wouldn't really be exposed to otherwise. Um, the lifestyle implications, um, no, not as bad as I had, had been expecting when I was a student. Um, it's, if I'm honest, it's not a nine-to-five job, and I don't think it ever will be. Um, sometimes you, you, you'll work weekends. Often when I do, I feel it's a, it's a personal failing because I've usually mismanaged my time in the week. And I've, I've, I've messed about on, on the internet and haven't got everything done, so that, that'll slip into the Saturday. But, and, and sometimes there will be an enormous deadline. But, I mean, generally, I, I probably haven't worked more than about four or five weekends this year. Um, it's I, Ideally, obviously, you, you, you don't want to if you can avoid it, uh, and more disciplined barristers than I will certainly avoid it and, and, and do. Um, but it's, it's something that will perhaps unlike other, area of, uh, uh, other areas you, you might go into impact sometimes on your social life, um, but, but nothing I can't, I can't handle and nothing that's, uh, that upsets me. Um, finally, key skills and personal qualities. I, I think, um, obviously, knowledge of the law and, and uh, ability to reason a legal problem is what, what you need in, in, the, in most areas at the, at the bar. Um, commercial law tends to be a little more competitive, um, which, which I can see from, from the, the number of people in this room um, and that, that, that can raise the bar a little bit in terms of, of, of entrance requirements um, but it's 
it, it's the sort of thing I, th I think you need, you need some personal discipline to be independent and to work for yourself um, and get everything done by a deadline um, without someone standing over you with a big stick telling you, uh, you you've got to do this by, by, by tomorrow. Um, it helps to be, <coughs> to be confident and to be personable. I mean, I, I often will go to a site and, and uh, meet, meet the project manager and you need to be able to get on with them and get them to do what they need to do and you have to be able to communicate um, what can be some fairly complex legal issues um, to someone who can then implement it in practice. Um, so that, that can be a, a good personal quality. Um, th th those are, th that's my sort of five minutes. Um, I'll hand over now to, to Rachel. Thank you. Um, so what I want to do is to dispel three myths about the commercial bar and hopefully in doing so explain to you uh, what on earth I'm doing there and why I like it. Um, so myth number one, all commercial barristers are in it for the money. Um, no. Uh, there's no secret that if you do commercial law, um, you're likely to be better paid than in, if you're in some other areas um, of law. But if that is the reason that you're sitting in this room because you think being a commercial barrister is going to make you rich and that's all you need, um, then uh, I hate to tell you that you're making a mistake. Uh, two reasons why I say that. Uh, the first, I think, is the most important. It is hard. Um, it is document heavy work. An awful lot of the things that we do are based on, on contractual documents. Um, and so you are going to need to like reading. You're going to be doing a lot of it. Um, you're also probably going to need to be a grammar pedant because the devil is in the detail when you're doing contractual work. Um, and all of that means that it is hugely demanding on your time. And uh, I'm sorry to the person I already told this to earlier at our stand. Um, the sort of most intense period of, of my working life was when I was on a big case a couple of years ago and I spent about six months getting up at 6am and going to bed at 2am for six months. Um, it's not always like that. After that case, I took a very long holiday. Um, but you have to recognise there are going to be periods where the demands on your time are going to be huge. Um, so you could not do this job if you didn't love it because it's tough. So you have to love it. Um, Luckily, I think it's easy to love um, because the cases that you do are very interesting um, and very varied. And to illustrate that, I thought I'd tell you about three of the cases that I've been involved in um, in the last couple of years. So um, firstly, at the moment, I'm representing a defendant in a um, commercial fraud claim. My client entered into a joint venture um, to buy a piece of land and develop a business proposition. Um, that uh, has stalled and my client's now being sued by its joint venture partner in part on the grounds that um, the potential value of the joint venture has been misrepresented. Um, I also, a couple of years ago, I was on the council team that represented a litigation funder in a $19 billion um, claim in conspiracy. Um, that case was about um, a judgment that was obtained by a group of claimants against an oil company for environmental damage. Uh, the oil company said that judgment had been obtained by fraud. My client had funded the enforcement of that judgment, and the oil company said, well, um, this judgment was obtained by fraud. You're party to the fraud because you didn't do your due diligence properly. Um, so that was pretty fascinating. Um, and the third uh, case that I wanted to tell you about is a little bit more straightforward. It was essentially a simple uh, breach of contract claim in a contract to supply, but the products being supplied were um, specific medical products that had a very short shelf life. Um, the whole contract turned on the interpretation of an exclusion clause. The exclusion clause meant that um, if it was upheld, the claim was worth about £10,000. If it wasn't upheld, the claim was worth about a million pounds. Um, so as I say, the devil's in the detail, an awful lot turned on um, the construction of that clause. Um, so the work is hard, but it's easy to love. Do we do it for the money? Um, no, although obviously it helps. Um, we do it because we think it's terribly sexy and exciting, even if the fact that we think that means that we are not. Um, <laughs> that's myth number one. Myth number two, commercial barristers never go to court. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but... You need to be savvy. Now, there are two things I say here. Um, the first is, I am told there are still some sets where that is true. Um, my set in particular will take um, people for third sixes and they will say, oh, I did my whole pupillage and I never went to court. 
Um, my set doesn't understand that. We're very keen on getting our juniors into court and getting you used to being in front of a judge and knowing the basics like which side are you supposed to be standing on. Um, all that sort of thing helps. Um, but there are sets out there that don't necessarily do that. You need to use your mini pupillages. You need to use your interviews to ask questions about how often you might be in court and what sort of work you're going to be doing. Um, and also, even if you're in a set that does get you into court like mine, you need to be aware it is a fact of life. A lot of commercial cases are complex, long running, high value. That means as a very junior barrister, you, you may be less likely to get into court on those cases than you are to get into court on other cases. So when I started out, I um, started doing a lot of product liability and PI. I still hung on to some of that because it means that now, five, six years in, it means I'm still in court once a week. I do a trial about once a month. Um, and that means that when I do go to court on my commercial cases, I, again, know which side I'm supposed to be standing on and I know what I'm doing. So be savvy when you interview, know where you're going. And once you're in practice, make sure you keep yourself in court um, so you've got your court legs on. Um, and myth number three, uh, commercial barristers don't have a social life. Um, this isn't necessarily true. I'm starting to realise these aren't myths so much as half-truths. Um, I work hard, I go home, I see my friends, I go for dinner, I do yoga. Um, most of the time, I manage to do all of those things. But I am a commercial junior. My job is to make my leaders' lives as easy and as stress-free as possible. Um, and that means I generally do a, a lot of the legwork. I do a lot of the pre-drafting of the court documents. I tend to do the first pass on all of that. I'll do the first pass on any documents that come in. Um, and what that means is you're slightly at the mercy of your leader. So you might have a leader that um, asks you to do a note on the entire law of causation. Um, you might have a leader that um, leaves everything to the last minute and then expects you to stay up all night and prep with them because that's your job. Um, you might not. I currently work with a senior junior who is very good at coordinating his time with me and we sit down and we plan ahead and we schedule our time so that it all works. Not all leaders are like that. If you get a difficult leader or one that makes huge demands on your time, you have to recognise that that is part and parcel of the job. Um, so the trick um, to having a social life as a commercial junior is know your leader, know what they're going to ask for and always try and be one step ahead. Um, that's the three myths debunked. Um, that's why I like commercial law, and I'll now hand on to Roz. Okay, so why I chose the bar, um, I would echo really what Peter said there about the independence that uh, being self-employed gives you. I also, when I was at your stage, I did a uh, placement, summer placement, in a big law firm where I spent, I think I spent three weeks there, which um, really rather put me off the idea of working in a big organisation. It also wasn't helped by the fact that the, the junior solicitor I was sharing a room with one day shut the door and um, and then sort of checked nobody lis was listening and said, I hate it here, don't come here. Um, <laughs> which <laughs> rather, rather struck me. Um, so I chose the bar because I wanted to work for myself and I also wanted to be um, an advocate, which is really one of the main differences between the bar and the solicitor's profession. Uh, in terms of the sort of cases that I deal with, I mentioned, I think in my introduction, three areas, which is banking, aviation and civil fraud. Banking is probably the largest part of my practice, and that can mean um, a, a range of size of cases. So for our junior tenants, people in the position of Rachel, it tends to be smaller cases in the county court, um, customers suing their banks, that type of thing. And it's very good for getting our junior members into court. As you get to be more senior and you get to be a QC, you're dealing with larger cases on a team of other barristers, quite a large team of um, solicitors. And some of the cases I've been involved in recently have been large claims by big corporate customers against banks to do with things like fixing LIBOR and that type of that type of thing. So and, and often it has links to regulatory issues as well. So um, the LIBOR side of things, there's been big in regulatory investigations both in the UK and in the States and there's been private law claims brought off the back of that. So uh, that's the sort of thing uh, I've been doing recently on that. Uh, aviation is another specialty within Chambers. 
That can mean a vast range of things from leasing disputes in relation to particular aircraft that have been leased out. It can be things to do with airports or airlines. And recently, quite a few of my colleagues and, and me, in fact, have been involved in the collapse of Monarch Airlines, which went into administration at the beginning of October. There's been quite a lot of work arising from that to do with the allocation of takeoff and landing slots and other kind of regulatory um, issues. And then lastly, civil fraud. That can be, so we're talking about private law claims where one party sues the other for fraud or conspiracy, that type of thing. I've, uh, a lot of that work at the commercial bar in the last 15 years has involved Russian parties who have uh, brought their claims here often against other Russian or former Soviet Union um, counterparties. And that's, that's been very interesting, raises a lot of issues um, as to Russian law and some very interesting fact situations, especially as to what was going on in the uh, Soviet Union uh, in the late 1990s. So these, are, these tend to be big cases where, apart from the smaller work I was talking about in the county court, the smaller banking claims, these are big cases which often settle before they go to court. But if they do go to court, they can take many weeks in trial. Uh, so the nature of the work tends to be sort of um, black or white in the sense that if you're in court, then um, that can be very, very intense. You can be working weekends, early mornings, late nights. Um, but the times when you're not in court are more uh, relaxed. You have more control over your own hours and you're not expected to work quite as hard. So, so for me, it tends to be um, either one thing or the other. Um, what I find appealing about this area of practice is the variety. You have a variety of fact situations. You're talking about very complex businesses with uh, very involved structures, long contracts. No two fact situations are ever the same. And that is not true of a lot of areas at the bar. A lot, of, a lot of practice areas, I think, are, can be quite samey because they involve uh, a similar sort of thing happening over and over again. And that just doesn't happen in commercial law. The other feature of commercial law is back, back to money again, it, but, it, but in a slightly different sense. The, the cases that we do are often worth a lot of money, which means that the clients are prepared to pay for high-quality legal representation and to often to take those cases to the higher courts. So I don't know how many of you are studying law, but the sort of cases that you'll be reading uh, as reported decisions tend to be in the Court of Appeal or even the Supreme Court. It costs a lot of money to take a case to those higher uh, appellate levels. And commercial work is, involves these, uh, these high-value high claims, and so you've got the funding to take those cases up to the higher courts and, and, and to have a well-resourced legal team to argue them. Now, the lifestyle implications, I thought I'd mention, um, from my own perspective, I've got uh, three children uh, who I've, um, uh, I, I've had while at, while at the bar. I've taken three periods of maternity leave and come back to work um, without too much trouble after each one. I find that the back to the self-employment point, uh, it's, it is, uh, except when you're in a very large, intense trial, uh, it is compatible with having a family, um, especially now when technology means that you can work at home. In fact, nobody need know where you are, really, um, most of the time when you're working. I find that uh, I normally get home in the evening to see my children before they, before they go to bed. Sometimes I'm logging on again after they've gone to sleep and working in the evenings, but I try not to work at weekends. And um, I find that um, for most of the time, it is a good, um, flexible career that you can really fit around a family. Of course, there are moments when uh, it's more difficult and uh, I don't see my children, you know, for several evenings in a row or I'm working all weekend, but those times are relatively rare. Then finally, the key skills and personal qualities that you think are needed. Uh, uh, Peter mentioned uh, the academic ability. I think that's, that's really the number one thing that we're looking at when we, when we get a pupillage application because the work we do is very difficult and it does require a high level of um, academic ability. So that's the main thing that we're looking for. 
The other thing I'd mention is that as a, as a barrister, even quite a junior barrister, you get a lot of responsibility at quite a young age. And you really do need to, as Peter mentioned, you need to be confident, you need to be self-reliant, uh, and you need to be able to um, project uh, a feeling of competence and um, unflappability, even when that's not necessarily how, how you're feeling. Uh, so, th so those are the things I would mention as regards personal qualities. So I think that probably concludes the introductory part um, of our presentation. So I think we'll just throw the floor open to questions, if anyone has any. Hi. Uh, this, is, um, this is to all of you, really. Um, when you're entering the bar, obviously you've, you've um, secured a privilege and there's certain um, criteria within, that, within the set that, that means you'll follow certain um, paths. But how do you get to the point where you you kind of end up specialising? For example, you mentioned technology, and and uh, Rosalind mentioned banking. Is that a is that a personal choice uh, completely, or is that as it were, are you steered by chambers in a lot of what you do and <coughs> work you've kind of been involved in? It's a very good question. Just just for the for the camera, um, the the question really is how do you come to specialise, um, firstly, in, in choosing your set, and secondly, within the set, how do you, how do you find the specialism um, that's right for you? Um, if, 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 uh, just speaking from my own perspective, I'm in a set that does construction, energy, technology, and some procurement. Um, I think, um, in terms of coming to the set to start with, um, I personally applied to a range of commercial sets, I think about 10 or 12, um, which varied from general commercial um, to, to banking, to shipping, and to construction. Um, and uh, of, of the offers I received, this, um, this Chambers was the one I, I, I felt uh, was the best fit for me, just, just in terms of how I felt doing the mini pupilage there um, and how I felt about the people who, who interviewed me. But it, it, was, it was largely a personal choice um, to come to the set itself rather than to come to construction itself. Um, Within my own practice, uh, I, I think our, our, um, our set does mostly construction and energy, which, which sort of come hand in hand. Um, and so I, I started out doing a lot of that. Um, I come from a software engineering background myself, and so my practice is slightly more technology orientated than perhaps other members, and that's really by choice. Um, and you can, you can forge your own way to a limited extent within the, within the boundaries of, of how your set specialises. And I think if you're in a more generalist set, um, there's possibly more areas that you can choose to go into. I, I should emphasise, if you want to build a practice in a specific area, um, although you'll, you'll have support from your set and, other, and, and perhaps other members of your set that might be interested in that particular area, you'll also have support from the clerks and from the business development personnel within your chambers. Um, it, it, it's, it's really up to you to build that practice. Um, so you, you might want to go out to firms um, and, and pitch for a large case. Um, or you might want to do seminars for firms that specialise in your er in the area you, you, you'd like to market to, and slowly you'll build a practice. Just an example, we, we have a fairly senior silk um, it, it, in our set who um, has built a practice in public procurement, which started out as a species of, of construction, because very often things that are constructed are publicly procured mm -hmm. through, through EU law. Um, and she's developed a, 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 an incredible practice, and she's one of the leading silks in the area now, and it's largely... Through, through years of, of pushing that, pitching to solicitors, becoming um, the talent in that area. And we now have, um, I think, five or six members of our chamber sort of follow her and, and a large part of their practice in public procurement. Um, so that it, 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 it develops organically, I think. Um, it depends on the set you're at, uh, and it's, it, but, 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 but it's possible. I think if I wanted to turn around and say, well, I want to do criminal law, I, I don't think that would be compatible with the set I'm in, and I'd probably want to change sets then. But it's not something that you're pigeonholed for life. And if you want to change with effort, I think you probably can. Yeah, I would just add to that from a from my perspective. Um, the work that we do in chambers is a bit broader. Um, we 
uh, encourage our juniors to try as many of our different practice areas when they first start as they can. Um, so I mentioned that I'm five years um, post pupillage and I really only started specialising in commercial law in the last, I would say, two years. Um, and you asked, you know, how do you go about doing that? Are you guided by your chambers? Well, in fact, I think I was really guided by my clients because the cases come in um, and you find that as you uh, gain experience and you think, oh, I like doing some of this, I want to do some more of this. And the, the cases that you enjoy more, you tend to build up a better rapport with your clients and you tend to invest more in them and then more work of that type tends to come in. So there is a little bit of a sort of it chooses you um, sense about it but um, as Peter was saying you can certainly um, do lots of things to build your practice yourself and your clerks and your chambers should help with that. Yeah I mean not much to add I, I ended up in aviation um, it wasn't something I particularly thought uh, when I started out that that had a burning desire to do but uh, I when I was a pupil my pupil master was doing a big aviation case and so I got to see what he was doing and I got to meet the solicitors that he was working with and actually one of them still sends me work today nearly 20 years later so it was luck actually I'd say more than anything else but having found that I quite liked it it um yes I, I managed to develop that area and 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 sort of seek out more work so it's a combination of luck um and also motivation yourself to go out and try and you know develop those particular areas of practice but it's as peter says it's within the outer boundaries of what it is that your set does you're not going to you're not going to be able to go beyond that so it's whatever you you like within that outer envelope as it were hello um, i have a question to the whole panel um do you think Brexit will change uh, your practice, the work here, uh, which is um, done in, uh, in Chambers? No. In future. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're, you're doing um, uh, banking as well, and uh, in the lights of the banking agency moving um, uh, to Paris, uh, as we know now, um, mo uh, I think uh, some of the firms will be moving uh, as well with the banking sector. Uh, do you think you'll still be getting instructed on the um, I don't think, I mean, I don't think the substance of the work will change, but you, you raise a valid point, which is um, people leaving um, the financial services sector. And I think there may be, in, you know, in a few years' time, you're right, there may be fewer um, of that sort of... Um, person in, in London doing that sort of work. I think, I hope London will still remain a major financial um, centre and that work will still be generated as a result of that. But I don't think, uh, I mean, in, in, area of, in, in the area of European law, it's a real problem for barristers because on the, you know, in March 2019, they're going to lose their rights of audience in the ECJ. Now, that's a problem. Um, we don't face that type of problem. But there may well be some, yeah, some tailing off as a result of people, um, people leaving the city. But I, I, I'm not expecting it to be dramatic. And to be honest with you, a lot of my work involves international clients, but not so much EU clients. It's, it's often people outside the EU who have chosen in their contract to litigate any disputes in London according to English law. And I don't see that changing. Um. Yeah, I, I, I can only add to that. I mean, a, a lot of my clients are based offshore, so I've worked for people in Bermuda and in Gibraltar and in Guernsey and Jersey. And um, regardless of, of what you say about the financial services sector, I think London is likely to remain a major centre for <coughs> litigation. And that's what people come to us for. And, and just add two, two, two points, really. Firstly, I, I think one area of law that is likely to be affected is, uh, I mentioned earlier, public procurement, because a lot, a lot of the rules on that come from European law and the European acquis. Um, I, I suspect, and, and who knows ultimately, but I suspect um, that will be replaced by domestic legislation broadly along similar lines, um, which will develop on its own path. So I suspect there will still be work, but the source of the law will differ. And really, to, to echo uh, Rachel's point, most of uh, of my clients internationally will will be outside of Europe, 
Um, and they, they will often have chosen uh, English law in their contract. For example, you, you might have an American financier um, paying a Chinese contractor to build a road in Africa, and they will choose English law, and often the, dis- the seat of dispute arbitration will be London. Um, so I think there will always be work for, for English barristers, uh, regardless of Brexit. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Oh, well, it would make no di- If you're doing an English law degree, it would make no difference at all. Um, if you were transferring, um, if you were a qualified Canadian lawyer transferring across, then that might raise more issues, um, still possible. But um, yeah, if you have an English law degree, you're just like any other um, applicant. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, sorry, can I ask, like, what proportion of um, incoming? Well, my husband's Canadian. Does that count? He's a barrister. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm just thinking out loud. But we have uh, we have quite a few junior tenants who are from Australia, um, and they tend to have actually done their first degree in Australia, and so they're transferring. Um, as I say, it's, it's not really a factor that we, you know. If you, if you have an English law degree, then you're English qualified and we wouldn't be looking at, you know, where you were from. The only thing I, I would say, and I think I said this, this to the people who are sitting next to you um, who asked me the same question earlier. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, pupillage is an investment by chambers yeah. in you. Um, they invest a lot of time and a lot of money in you. Um, and the one question that you might find yourself being asked is, whether you have a genuine desire to stay here and to stay at the bar and whether you have a genuine commitment to being at the English bar. That is, I think, the only possible um, point that you might want to think about. Um, it's the only question I can imagine that you yes. might be asked. Um, but as Ross says, otherwise, there's, there's, there's no difference. I can add nothing to that. So. <laughs> Was there a question at the back earlier? Yes, yes. hi. Um, well, I think in addition to um, a, a, a sort of academic excellence, I think the other factors are important. Um, impact, ability to express yourself clearly. Um, in terms of your paper application, I think a lot of people will do mooting and debating, and that, that is good advice. My, uh, my own advice is to try and do something and try and put it on your form if you do do it that sets you apart from others. If you have an unusual mm-hmm. hobby... Uh, it's, it's generally good life advice, I think. Try and do something interesting and um, put it on your form, and often you'll be asked about that during your interview. Mm-hmm. And then you'll be that person who does that thing, um, which, will, which will help you to stand out and show that you're a more rounded person. Mm-hmm. We, we will get a lot of applicants who have, have got very good degrees, have done the mooting, have done the debating, have ticked all the boxes, um, and, and all, all that does is it brings you in, in line with everybody else, and it's, it's mm-hmm. good then to have something else that distinguishes you. So I would only encourage that. Um, three things that I would say um, marshalling is a great thing to do it's like a mini pupillage but with a judge it's amazing how much sitting on the other side of the bench makes you realise things about advocacy that you didn't know before why don't you like this advocate what is it they're doing wrong or what is it they're not saying or what do you need to hear from them that they haven't said yet Um, so that's the first thing the second thing is any pro bono that will get you into court Um, through is really good for that I know through cases are really hard to come by um, but anything you can do of that nature where you can say I've done something that's roughly similar to being a barrister so I know I like it Um, the third thing the question on the form where you have to say why you want to go to this set is the hardest question to answer and it is the one that is most frequently answered badly Um, because (coughs) the real answer is you are offering a pupillage and I would like a pupillage and that's it Um, so use your mini pupillages to pick up information about the set that you can then use on your form How often are the juniors in court? What sort of work do they do? What mix of work? Are they mostly led? Do they mostly have their own cases? What sort of courts are they in? Do they all get on? Do they all go out for dinner? 
anything like that that you can use to put on your form and make a credible case for, I have been to Henderson Chambers, I know what you're about, and this is why I want to come to you. If you can answer that question well, you will set yourself apart from a huge number of other people, apart from now, obviously, everyone sitting in this room. <laughs> okay, so just one don't. Okay, you've heard some do's, but don't. When trying to make yourself stand out, don't write your form in a sort of idiosyncratic or flowery way. There's nothing more irritating than trying to read about somebody and they're sort of using four words where one will do. Just use normal English, to, you know, in simple, easy to understand terms to, to, to make the points that you want to make. By all means, put down hobbies that make you stand out, but don't make yourself stand out through the language because that, that always backfires. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much to our panel for giving up their insanely valuable time. <laughs>